Live from San Francisco, California, it's theCUBE. Covering the IBM Chief Data Officer Summit. Brought to you by IBM. Welcome back to San Francisco, everybody. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in live tech coverage. We go out to the events, we extract the signal from the noise, and we're here at the IBM Chief Data Officer Summit, 10th anniversary. Seth Dobrin is here. He's the Vice President and Chief Data Officer of the IBM Analytics Group. Seth, always a pleasure to have you on. Good to see you again. Yeah, thanks for having me back, Dave. You're very welcome. So I love these events. You get a chance to interact with, with Chief Data Officers, guys like yourself. We've been talking a lot today about IBM's internal transformation, how IBM itself is operationalizing uh, AI. And maybe we can talk about that, but I'm most interested in how you're pointing that at customers. What have you learned from your internal experiences and what are you bringing to customers? Yeah, so you know, I was hired in IBM to lead part of our internal transformation, so I spent a lot of time doing that. Right. Uh, I've also, you know, when I came over to IBM, I had just left uh, Monsanto where I led part of their transformation. So I spent the better part of the first year or so at IBM not only focusing on our internal efforts, but helping our clients transform. And out of that, um, I found that many of our clients needed help and guidance on how to do this. And so I started a team we call the Data Science uh, and AI Elite Team. And really what we do is we sit down with clients, we share uh, not only our experience, but the methodology that we use internally at IBM. So leveraging things like design thinking, DevOps, uh, Agile, um, and how you implement that uh, in the context of, of data science and AI. I have a question, so Monsanto, obviously completely different business than IBM, Yeah. but when we talk about digital transformation and they talk about the difference between a business and a digital business, it comes down to the data. And you've seen a lot of examples where you see companies traversing industries, which never used to happen before. You know, Apple getting into music, and there are many, many examples, and you know, the theory as well, it's because it's data. So when you think about your experiences of a completely different industry, uh, bringing now the expertise to IBM. Were there similarities that you were able to draw upon or was it a completely different experience? No, I think, I think there's tons of similarities, which is, um, which is part of why I was excited about this and I think IBM was excited to have me. Um, because the, the, the chances for, sex, for success were quite high in your mind, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah because the chances for success were quite high. Um, and, and also, you know, if you think about it, there, there's on, on the how you implement, how you execute, the differences are really cultural more than they're anything to do with the business, right? So it's, you know, the whole role of a chief data officer or chief digital officer or chief analytics officer is to drive fundamental change in the business, right? So it's how do you manage that cultural change? How do you build bridges? How do you make people feel, you know, how do you make people a little uncomfortable? but at the same time get them excited about how to leverage things like data and analytics and AI to change how they do business. And, and really this concept of a digital transformation is about moving away from traditional products and services more towards outcome-based services and, and not selling things but selling as a service, right? And, and it's the same whether it's IBM, uh, you know, moving away from fully transactional to cloud and, and subscription-based offerings, or it's a bank uh, reimagining re how they interact with their customers, or it's an oil and gas company, or it's a company like Monsanto really thinking about how do we provide outcomes. But how do you make sure that every as a service is not a snowflake and it can scale so that you can actually you know, make it a business? So under, underneath the as a service is a few things. One is data, one is and machine learning and AI. Uh, the other is really understanding your customer, right? Because truly digital companies do everything through the eyes of their customer. And so every company you know, has many, many ver versions of their customer until they go through an exercise of creating a single version, right? A customer or a client 360, if you will. And we went through that exercise at IBM. And, and those are all very consistent things, right? They're all pieces that kind of happen the same way in every company regardless of the industry. And then you get into understanding what the desires of your customer are to do business with you differently. So, you were talking before about the chief digital officer, chief data officer, chief analytics officer as a change agent. <laughs> Making people feel a little bit uncomfortable. Explore that a little bit. What's that, asking them questions that intuitively they they know they need to have the answer to, but they don't uh, through data. What, what did you mean by that? Yeah, so, so here, here's the conversations that usually happen, right? You go and you talk to your, your peers in the organization, 
and you start having conversations with them about you know, what decisions are they trying to make, right? And you're the chief data officer, you're responsible for that, and inevitably the conversation goes something like this, and I'm going to paraphrase, give me the data I need to support my preconceived notions. <laughs> Yeah. Right? Right. Um, and that's what they want. Here's the answer, give that, me the data. That, that, right, so yeah. I want a dashboard that helps <laughs> me support this. And the uncomfortableness comes in a couple of things in that. It's getting them to let go of that and allow the data to provide some inkling of things that they didn't know were going on. That's one piece. The other is then you start leveraging machine learning or AI to ha actually help start driving some decisions. So limiting the scope from infinity down to two or three things and surfacing those two or three things and telling people in your business, your choices are one of these three things, right? That starts to make people feel uncomfortable um, and really is a challenge for that cultural change, getting people used to trusting the machine or in some instances even trusting the machine to make the decision for you or part of the decision for That's got to be one of the biggest cultural challenges because you've got somebody who's, let's say they run a big business, it's a profitable business, it's the engine of cash flow at the company, and you're saying, well, that's not what the data says. And, it, and, and, and you're saying, okay, here's a future path yeah. for success, but it's, it's going to be disruptive. There's going to be a change, and I could see people not wanting to go there. Yeah, and, and, and if you look at, you know, to the point about you know, even businesses that are making the most money for, or parts of a business that are making the most money, if you look at what the business journals say, you start leveraging data and AI, you get double digit increases in your productivity, in, your, you know, in, in differentiation from your competitors. That happens inside of businesses too. So, the conversation even with the most profitable parts of the business or you know, highly contributing the most revenue is really, well, we could do better, right? You could get better margins on this revenue you're driving. You could, you know, that's the whole point is to get better leveraging data and AI to increase your margins, you know, increase your revenue, all through data and AI. And then, you know, things like moving to as a service from single points of transaction that's a whole different business model and that leads from you know, once every two or three or five years getting revenue to you get revenue every month, right? That's highly profitable for companies because you, know, you're no, you don't have to go in and send your sales force in every time to sell something. They buy something once and they continue to pay as long as you keep them happy. But I can see that scaring people because if the incentives don't shift to go from a, you know, all up, pay all up front, right? The, the, there's so many parts of the organization that have to align with that in order for that culture to actually occur. So, can you give some examples of how you've, I mean, obviously you ran, ran through that at IBM. You, you saw, I'm yeah. sure, a lot of that. You got a lot of learnings and then took that to clients. Maybe some examples of, of, of client successes that you've had. Yeah. Or, or even not so successes that you've learned from. Yeah, so in terms of client success, I think many of our clients are just beginning this journey. Certainly the ones I, I work with are beginning their journey. Mm -hmm. So it's hard for me to say client X has successfully done this. Um, but I can certainly talk about how we've gone in and some of the use cases we've done Great. with certain clients to think about you know, how they transform their business. So, uh, you know, Maybe the biggest, the biggest bang for the buck one um, is, uh, is in the oil and gas industry. So Exxon Mobil was on stage with me, I think, um, talking about right. some of the work that we've done with them um, in their upstream business, right? So you know, every time they drop a well, it costs them you know, not thousands of dollars, but hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, and in the oil and gas industry, you're talking massive data, right? tens of, or hundreds of petabytes of data that constantly changes, and no one in that industry really had a data platform that could handle this dynamically. And it takes them months to, to get, to even start to be able to make a decision. So they really want us to help them figure out, well how do we build a data platform on this massive scale that enables us to be able to make decisions more rapidly. And so the aim was really to cut this down from you know, 90 days to you know, less than a month and through leveraging some of our tools as well as some open source technology and teaching them new ways of working, we we're able to lay down this foundation. Now this is before we even ha haven't even started thinking about helping them with AI. You know, oil and gas industry has been doing this type of thing for decades, but they really were struggling with this platform. So that's a big success where, at least for the pilot, which was a small subset of their fields, we were able to help them reduce that time frame you know, by a lot to be able to start making a decision. So an example of a decision might be where to drill next? That's exactly the decision yeah. they're trying to make. Because 
for years in that industry, it was boop, oh, no oil. Oh, no, well, yeah. now, well, now and they, and they, yeah. they got more sophisticated, they started to use data, but you're, I think what you're saying is the time it took for that analysis was so, quite So the long. time it took to even overlay things like seismic data, topography data, what's happened in wells and cores they've drill and drilled around that has, was really protracted just to pull the data together, right? And then once they got the data together, there were some really, really smart people looking at it going, well, my experience says here, and it was it was driven by the data, but it was not driven by an algorithm. A little so, bit of art, too. Yeah, right? A lot of art, yeah. right? And it still is. So now they want some some AI or some machine learning, if you you know, to to help guide those those geophysicists to help determine where, based on the data, they should be dropping wells. And you know, these are hundred bill, hundred million billion dollar decisions they're making. So it's really about how do we help them. And that's just one example. I mean, every yeah. industry has its own. Yeah, and use so that's cases on the front end, yeah. right? About the data foundation. Then if you go to a company that was really advanced in leveraging analytics or machine learning, uh, you know, J P Morgan Chase, um, you know, in there, uh, they have a division, um, and also they were on stage with me, I think, um, that. They have basically everything is driven by models. So they give traders a, mod, a series of models and they make decisions. And now they need to monitor those models, those hundreds of models they have, for misuse of those models, right? And so they needed to build a series of models to manage, to monitor their models. Right. Um, and this was a tremendous deep learning uh, use case and they had just bought um, a Power AI box from us so they wanted to start leveraging GPUs and we really help them figure out how do you navigate and what's the difference between building a model leveraging GPUs compared to CPUs, how do you use it to accelerate your, the output, and again, this was really a cost avoidance play because if people misuse these models, they can get in a lot of trouble, but they also need to make these decisions very quickly because a trader goes to make a trade, they need to make a decision, was this used properly or not before that trade is, is, is kicked off and you know, milliseconds make a difference in, in the stock market, and so they needed a model. And, and one of the, the things about, you know, when you start leveraging DP, GPUs and deep learning is, sometimes you need these GPUs to do training, and sometimes you need them to do training and scoring. And this was a case where you need to also build a pipeline that can leverage the GPUs for scoring as well, which is actually quite complicated and not as straightforward as you might think. In, in near real time, in, in real in time. Pretty close to yeah, real I mean, time, I mean, yeah. You, you can't get much more real time than milliseconds, yeah. potentially to stop a trade before it occurs and protect the firm, yeah. right? Yeah, or think, green and light I, it. Yeah, and don't quote, I, I think this is right, I think they actually don't do trades until it's confirmed. And so, right. or that's the desire is to not Well, and then now you're in a competitive situation where, yeah. you know. Yeah, I mean, people put these trading mm -hmm. floors as close to the stock yeah. exchange as they can. Physically. To, physically yeah, to minimum latency, right? right? right, right so right, right, every, right. every millisecond counts. Yeah, read flash boys, right. it's good, interesting. <laughs> yeah. So, what's the biggest challenge you're finding, both at IBM and in your clients, in terms of operationalizing uh, AI? Is it technology, is it culture, is it process, is it? Yeah, so culture is always hard, but I think, you know, as we start getting to really think about integrating AI and data into our operations, right? As you look at what software development did with this whole concept of DevOps, right? And really rapidly iterating, but getting things into a production ready pipeline, looking at you know, continuous integration, continuous de development. What does that mean for data and AI? And it's this concept, these concepts of data ops and AI ops, right? And I think data ops is very similar to DevOps in that things don't change that rapidly. Right, you build your data pipeline, you build your data assets, you integrate them. They may change you know, on the weeks or months time frame, but they're not changing on the hours or days time frame. As you get into some of the, these, these AI models, some of them need to be retrained within a day, right? Because the data changes, they fall out of parameters, or the parameters are very narrow, mm. and you need to keep them in there. What does that mean? How do you integrate this for your, for your, into your CI, CD pipeline? How do you know when you need to do regression testing on the whole thing again? Um, does your data science and AI pipeline even allow for you to integrate into your current CI, CD pipeline? So this is actually uh, an IBM-wide effort that our, my team is leading to start thinking about how do we incorporate what we're doing into people's CI, CD pipeline so we can enable AI ops if you will, um, or ML ops. Um, 
And, and really, really, IBM is the only company that's positioned to do that for so many reasons. One is, we're the only one with a, an end-to-end -end tool chain. So we do everything from you know, data, feature development, feature engineering, you know, generating models, whether selecting models, whether it's auto AI or hand coding or visual modeling into things like trust and transparency. And so we're the only one with that entire tool chain. Secondly, we've got IBM research, we've got you know, decades of industry experience, we've got our, our IBM services organization. All of us have been tackling with this with large enterprises, so we're, we're uniquely positioned to really be able to tackle this in, in, a, in a very enterprise grade manner. Well, and the leverage that you can get within IBM and, and for your customers. And leveraging our clients, right? It's so off we, the have, we have six yeah. clients that are, you know, our most advanced clients that are working with us on this. So it's not just us in a box, it's us with our clients working so on it. So what this. are you hoping to have happen today? We're just about to get started with the, with the keynotes. Yep. Uh, we're going to take a break and then come back after the keynotes and we get some great guests. But what are you hoping to get out of today? Yeah, so I've been with IBM for two and a half years. And I've, I've, this is my eighth CDO summit. So I've been to many more of these than I've been at IBM. And I went to these religiously before I joined IBM, really for two reasons. One, there's no sales pitch, right? There's not, it's not a trade show. The second is, it's the only place where I get the opportunity to listen to my peers and really have open and candid conversations about the challenges they're facing and how they're addressing them and really giving me insights into what other industries are doing and being able to benchmark me and my organization against you know, the leading edge of what's going on in this space. I love it, I, and that's why I love coming to these, these events. It's practitioners talking to practitioners. Seth Dorman, thanks so much for yeah, coming to theCUBE. Yeah, thanks as always, Dave. Always a pleasure. All right, keep it right there, everybody. We'll be back right after this short break. You're watching theCUBE live from San Francisco. Right back.